So the example we just worked, we dealt with very short signals and actually just computing each value of the discrete time convolution was very straightforward. Well, we now need to think about what happens when we're dealing with signals that don't have just a handful of samples. What if they go on for forever to the right or something like that? So we need a more general approach for doing discrete time convolution. And the way we typically do this is with this reflect, shift, and sum approach. Basically, we need to be able to plot the components of the discrete time convolution. We need to be able to plot x of m and h of k minus m. And we need to be able to, need to, be able to plot h of k minus m for different values of k. And we plot it for different values of k. We take the product, we multiply these two signals, and we sum them to get out the output. And then we shift h around on the time axis to get different intermediate signals. So we do this all the time in continuous time convolution with creating a time flipped and shifted copy and sliding it up and down the time axis to get these different types of signals. And this allows us to compute the convolution for a large range of signals easily with an analytic answer instead of just getting a number out by plugging into the sum. So let's go ahead and look at this procedure and example. Really what it boils down to is being able to plot x of m and h of k minus m and then shifting h around on the time axis. And you'll, and you'll see what we mean as we get into this example. So this first one we want to look at reflect, shift, and sum approach number one. And we'll start off with one, uh, one of the more easier cases we can do. There's only going to be a couple cases that we need to consider. Some of the ones that we'll look at in example number two get a little bit more involved. But for now, let's start off with the signal x of k equals alpha to the k u of k. And let's assume that alpha is a real number between 0 and 1. So if we plotted x of k, it would look something like this. It's essentially this decaying exponential. It turns on at time 0 and then decays as you go to the right. And then the other signal we're going to consider is the signal h of k. And h of k is just a unit step. So it's 0 everywhere below 0. And then at time 0, it turns on and it's equal to 1. And we are going to compute the convolution of these two things. So we are going to compute y of k equals x of k convolved with h of k. By definition, that means evaluate the sum m equals minus infinity to infinity x of m times h of k minus m. So it's this sum that we need to evaluate. And the problem is, since we have infinitely long signals, doing this by actually writing out each term in the sum isn't possible anymore because we'd have to write out an infinite number of terms. So we need a more general approach to doing this. The key to doing it involves being able to sketch what does x of m look like and being able to sketch h of k minus m. What does h of k minus m look like? If we can understand what those two pieces look like for different values of k, then we can actually get closed form answers for this summation often. So let's think about that. What does x of m look like? Well, x of m looks just like x of k, but with the time variable k replaced by m. So x of m is very simple to plot. It looks just like x of k. h of k minus m is a little trickier. h of k minus m, that is a time-reversed and shifted copy of the original signal. So when I time-reverse it, I get a unit step that is on for all negative time, and when I shift it, that shifts the place that it turns off to time k. So originally I had a signal h of k that was off and then turned on at 0. By flipping it, I flipped it to turn on at time minus infinity and turn off at 0. And then when I shift it by the amount k, it no longer turns off at time 0, it turns off at time k. So this is what h of k minus m looks like. So I have these two pieces sketched. And when I sketch h of k minus m, it's very important to plot it with k as a variable. So don't, don't plot it for a specific value of k. Actually leave k as a variable there on the time axis. You'll notice when I plotted h of k minus m, I did not label where the origin is, right? I didn't put where 0 is, because right now k is just a variable, and k could be to the left of the time origin, or it could be the, to the right of the time origin. What we're going to do now is we're going to consider different cases, and as we consider different cases and values for k, we'll be able to actually sketch h of k minus m on the time axis with the time origin. So what about the case where k is less than 0? So here's my sketch of x of m. x of m doesn't change. It's always the same because it doesn't involve k. When k is less than 0, my signal h of k minus m turns off 
before time zero. So it, in this example, I actually plotted it for k equals two, or minus two, I'm sorry. So it turned off at time minus two. So right here, I can see I don't have any overlap. If I was to multiply x of m times h of k minus m for this particular value, they don't have any non-zero overlap. Every time I multiply them at each point in time, one of them is zero. For instance, at time one, h of k minus m is zero. At time minus two, x of m is zero. There's never a point in time where both of them are non-zero. So there's no overlap here. So this product is equal to zero over the entire time axis. So when I actually do my summation over m from minus infinity to infinity, I get that y of k is zero. So for this case, for this case of all the values of k less than zero, I get that the convolution is equal to zero. So the next case I need to consider is k greater than or equal to zero. So I'll go ahead and sketch x of m again. And then when I sketch h of k minus m, I'm now considering for values where k is greater than or equal to zero. So now h of k minus m is kind of slid into the portion of time where x is actually on. So now there is some overlap. They actually overlap for time zero and time one all the way up to time k. Again, I've left k here as a variable because for different values of k, the amount that they overlap is a different amount. But this picture where I've sketched it helps us figure out what that exact amount is. So now when I write out my summation, it's still a sum from minus infinity to infinity, but I know that most of those terms are actually zero. All the time at minus one, minus two, all the way down to minus infinity, all those terms are zero. Also, for all times above k, those are zero. So k plus one, k plus two, those are all zero. The only times that I have overlap are for the times zero to k. So my summation is from zero to k, and the summation is of the product x of m times h of k minus m, just the exact things that I've sketched in that picture. So I can rewrite this, m equals zero to k. What is x of m? x of m is alpha to the m. That's the equation for x of m on the time interval zero, one, two, three, all the way up to k. What is h of k minus m on that time interval? Well, it's just one, so I've replaced it with one. So I now have a sum from m equals zero to k of alpha to the m. So how are we gonna solve this? Well, we need, we need to know something else. If we go look at our table, we have a table of closed form summations. One of the ones that we use and will use quite a bit is this. The sum from n equals zero to capital N minus one, alpha to the n is equal to n when alpha is one, or it's equal to one minus alpha to the n over one minus alpha for any other complex alpha. So this is a very nice result, and this is the exact same form that we currently have our summation in. We currently have the sum alpha to the m. It does not matter that the counter variable here is m, we could easily replace it with n. But using this result, we can easily write down the closed form result. It's one minus alpha to the k plus one over one minus alpha. Be careful here, the table result says if I sum from zero up to capital N minus one, then my answer is one minus alpha to the capital N. So whatever that top limit is, you always add one to it when you write down the answer. So here our top limit was k, so when I wrote down the answer, I wrote down alpha to the k plus one. So this is the result of our discrete time convolution for all time greater than or equal to zero. So I now know what my result is for time greater than or equal to zero. It's equal to one minus alpha to the k plus one over one minus alpha. And for all time less than zero, it was equal to zero. So I can combine those into just one nice equation by using the unit step function. And y of k is equal to the parentheses termed times u of k. I could plot this too versus k if I wanted to. So this is something that is zero for all time less than zero. And then as time gets more positive, this is a signal that kind of ramps up to a fixed value. As k gets larger and larger and larger, since alpha is less than one, alpha to the k plus one gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So eventually the numerator goes to one. So one minus something that's decaying, it goes to one. So eventually for a very large k, this turns into one over one minus alpha. So this is an exponential term that's kind of ramping up and going to this steady state value for large values of k. So that's the end of this example. The, the process that we did here, you know, being able to sketch x of m and being able to sketch 
x of k minus m for different values of k, that's really the key to doing these problems. Once you can accurately sketch those two signals and sketch them for different values of k, doing the sum is, is kind of the easy part as long as it's a summation that has a nice closed form result. The next example we look at will have more cases that we'll have to consider, but we'll use the exact same process. Sketch x of m, sketch x h of k minus m, and then slide the h signal around for different signal results.